Today is Palm Sunday, which marks one of the most important weeks in the history of mankind. Sure, at the end of the week there may be a dark day, but today is not dark. Today the streets are full with excited people. Today, a Galilean man is giving people hope. This man, Jesus, he's known across the country as a great teacher, a miracle worker, a lover of the outcast, someone whose very presence demands authority, someone who would make a great king. And today, he is marching into the capital and is causing quite a stir. Crowds are on the street cheering him on as he rides toward the city gates on a young colt. When the crowds see him, they see hope. They see a future. They see a king. And they begin to lay palm branches all along the road. And they shout, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. What a glorious sight. What a welcome fit for a king. Welcome to Harvester this morning. We're glad you're here. If you are new with us, let me just tell you what's happening. We took a break. We're in a 30-week seri 30 series called Believe. But we took a break, and we're going to take a break for the next few weeks for a reason. Of course, this weekend and the next, throughout this week, we're going to look at the story of redemption of Jesus in three different uh, parts. And uh, we call this one Welcoming the King because maybe you have heard it said that this Sunday, this specific Sunday before Resurrection Sunday, is considered what we call Palm Sunday or the Triumphal Entry Sunday. And uh, let me just, uh, that's, that's what we're going to be talking about, is we're going to be reading out of Matthew 21, but before we go anywhere else, let me just ask a question. How many of you like horror movies? Just raise your hand, okay? Very good, some of you do. Uh, some of you may be like my wife, she does not like it or enjoy you know, horror movies. And I'll tell you what, I don't mind horror movies like, you know, just the suspense and a little bit of the jumps whenever they, you know, have loud noises and this and that, but I really don't prefer them, mostly because you know, they have really flat character development and storylines. And you know, it's like, how many times does it take for you to realize you should have a buddy system when you hear a noise outside? It, or maybe even better, it's like, don't go, you hear a noise, who cares? You know, turn on the TV, stay warm inside when there's lights. I mean, just don't do it. You know, or how many times does it take you to learn that if you don't turn on the light before you start searching for someone, you'll probably die? It's like, just. Just stop doing that, and you know, the villains, you know, are usually just uh, horrible, and just, you know, that's the reason that I, I don't enjoy them all the time, but uh, here's the worst part about horror movies, is that there are only two possible kinds. It's the kind where everybody dies except the one character that's supposed to survive, that, you know, miraculously, you know, all the bullets and all the traps and everything misses them, or the one where you think, Man, that one person made it, and then somehow they die a horrific death at the, at the very end. And then they end up with some type of heavy metal music. You know, and that's how, how, that's how horror movies end. That's, that's it, one or the other. Either the one person survives, or none of them do. And you end up with a little bit of rock and roll at the end, as you see the titles, you know, scroll down the screen. Well, when I listen, when I, when I read this scripture, the triumphal entry, you know, I've always had a hard time understanding what happened here. Because it feels like it's one of those horror movies where you're like, wait, could this be a good ending? You read the story of Jesus and you see people rejected him, but then you see him gaining momentum. And then he's finally, I think that people are getting it. He's finally, these people are finally saying, Hosanna to the son of David, Hosanna to the king. In other words, save us, save us, king of David, save us. Uh, king, save us, son, son of David. And then, if you keep reading the story, you find that just a week later, the same people are saying, crucify him. You know, we want Barabbas. Crucify, you know, Jesus. 
And, and I always had a hard time understanding how that happens in real life. And this is one of those things that, you know, for the longest time you just learn it, this is the way it is. But we need to figure out and dig deeper a little bit, and I hope we do this today, as to why a crowd of people were able to do this. One weekend you welcome them, and the next weekend you are done with them and you send them to the cross. Were these evil people? I have a hard time believing they were insincere whenever they, they were saying, you know, welcome. Did they have a problem of, you know, forgetting everything? I doubt it. I think in reality, the problem was that their picture of Jesus didn't match to who Jesus really was. What they wanted Jesus to be didn't match who they wanted Jesus to be. And I think that that's a problem not only in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, it's a problem today. You and I may have a picture of Jesus that doesn't match the God of the Bible. And I hope that we point it out today so that we can actually surrender and welcome the real Jesus. Not the Jesus that you want, but the Jesus that actually is. So today, my challenge is this. If you welcome Jesus, and I'm not, I'm not even telling you to welcome Him. That's your choice. But if you want to welcome Jesus into your life, you need to welcome Jesus as He is, not as you would have Him be. Just welcome Jesus as He is, the God of the Bible, the Jesus that you see here in Scripture, not as you want Him to be. Let me tell you this, this story to, to, to uh, just uh, show you how God works in our lives sometimes. Um, Joni was or 11 years old when she went to a Christian camp. And she grew up in a middle school, upper middle class family, a middle, middle class family, so she was you know, had all the privileges that, you know, a kid should have. Her family knew about God. They taught her, you know, all the stories of the Bible. And, and she says that when she went to this Christian camp at age 11, for the first time she understood what the message of the gospel was about. The speaker said something about, you know, to the kids about, I want you to compare your lives not to one another, but to these Ten Commandments. And he listed the Ten Commandments, and she remembers you know, thinking about those Ten Commandments and how her life, you know, there were some things that she had never done, but there were others that she definitely was guilty of, and, and she remembers feeling the sense of guilt, but then, you know, feel a little bit, you know, odd, odd, because how could a God ask us to follow all these rules if He knew that we could never do it? And, and she said it was then that she realized that it was always about Jesus. That Jesus is the one that could fulfill all these commandments and then He died for us and that's why she could actually have salvation because it was Jesus the one that lived a perfect life and died in unjust death and so now we can take advantage of that sacrifice. And so she said that she went forward and prayed the prayer and, and was baptized later on and, and accepted Jesus. Now, as, as she grew as a Christian, she said that a problem arose. And the problem is that in this culture, she started intermixing just a relationship with God with the American dream. And she said that as she got a little older, having everything that she ever needed, she started thinking that God was there to give her what she wanted and all of her needs and, and, and all the things that she ever dreamed of, dreamt of. And so she started asking for things like, hey, help me be more popular in school. And she went to God with these things, help me lose some weight, help me be prettier, and help me do all these things that were just for her own sake, for her own pleasure. And, and she said that as she started seeing God as a way to fulfill, fulfill her own purposes, you know, she started veering off away from God. So she started all of a sudden, you know, getting interested in, in, in things that shouldn't interest her as a Christian. She started doing things that probably weren't okay. And she just saw herself walking away from the Lord. Now, she said that her last year of high school, she was 17. She prayed a prayer. She said, you know, she was in, struggling with many things in her life. And in the midst of that, she asked the Lord to save her. She just cried out to God and said, would you rescue me? She said it was a prayer that she will never forget. 
But of course, she didn't see anything happen right away. And a few weeks later, she went on a trip with a bunch of friends and her sister. And they were just, you know, being teenagers, you know, swimming and having fun. And one of those things that they were doing is just diving off of a small cliff that was there. She said that she became careless and she found herself diving into shallow waters. When this happened, she remembers just her head hitting this rock, what seemed to be the bottom, and then put, you know, her head being pushed back really far. And she found herself there on the water, facing down, praying that someone would see her or she was going to die. Before we go anywhere else in the story and to see how God answers uh, Joni's prayer, I want you to, to look into scripture that we're going to study today and learn how we have to welcome Jesus. If you want Jesus in your life, you have to welcome Him as He really, the way that He really is. Not, not the way that you want Him, but the way that He really is. And the question is, how do we do this? We have to learn a few lessons from this passage before we go anywhere else. Otherwise, you may be that one person. I think all of us have been at some point in our lives trying to worship God on Sunday. And then you come, Monday comes or Tuesday or Wednesday or whatever day, less than a week. And you find yourself veering off from God. Just kind of just your, your whole life walks in different directions. It seems like Sundays is one way and then you go different ways during the week and you try to come back but maybe you're just not welcoming Jesus, the real Jesus. You're welcoming a version of Him that maybe doesn't really exist. You're welcoming a version of, of Jesus where you're still in charge and not Him. And so for us to welcome Him, we must learn how to do it daily. And, and to do that, we're going to open our Bibles there in Matthew 21 and there are a few principles, a few lessons that we can learn from there. I'm going to read Matthew 21, it's just 11 verses, and this is going to be our text for the day, and just if you, you're welcome to follow along, I'm going to read first seven verses. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her, untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and He will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. Uh, Jesus was making a deliberate effort to show Jerusalem, to show Israel that He was their King. He went straight to a prophecy from Zechariah 9, 9, 8 through 10, and He applied it to Himself and He said, This is my entrance as King into Jerusalem. And it was a rather different entrance than most kings. See, not many of us, you may not know this, but that same day, more than likely, or at least that same week, another king had entered Jerusalem. He was actually a governor of the Judean area, Pontius Pilate. Jesus would face him actually a week later. And, and Pontius Pilate would do this year after year. In fact, every governor would always come to Jerusalem a week before the Passover for one reason. This Jewish celebration was a celebration about God delivering the Israelites from a foreign power. And so Rome, as intelligent as they were, they thought, we can't, I mean, we're going to let you celebrate that, but we don't really mean it. So on this time, during this time, we want to make sure that we're going to send a couple of legions, probably with the governor, that's about three to 6,000 soldiers, and we're going to be just in the city celebrating with you making sure that you don't get any crazy ideas and try to rebel. It had been years, it was 4 BC was the last rebellion that, that the Jewish people ever tried to, to do. It, it got 2,000 people crucified. And so Rome had a firm arm saying, you will not get any ideas, so we're gonna send people. 
So right before the Passover, Pontius Pilate probably entered the city. And I want you to picture this. You know, drummers just uh, having a beat for the soldiers. And just soldiers walking in, you know, just shiny leather armor and, and helmets and shields and spears or swords and, or bows. You know, just walking, each one with a helper. Just all these people down the city from the west into the center of the city, right by the temple, where they could keep an eye on these Jews. That was the sight that was probably seen by many people, either right before Jesus entered, or a couple of days prior. And so, and can you imagine if, if this nation, you know, just had someone to lead them out of slavery, out of that, just like, like happened one time in, with Egypt, you know, out of the, the power of the Roman Empire. And that's exactly what they saw in Jesus. All of a sudden, Jesus says, it's my turn to come into the city. And he's riding on a donkey, which means he, he didn't come in war. He came in peace. He was gentle. He comes in unexpected ways. If you want to welcome Jesus, the first thing that you need to understand, and, and this is where you, we have in your boat is a, a black, black to fill in. You have to prepare for the unexpected. If I were to ask you, how did Jesus come into your life? I guarantee you that the stories that we would hear are very different. Everybody received Jesus in a different way, and maybe some of you grew up in a Christian home and you, you had that blessing, but maybe you didn't get it until something happened. Maybe for you it was very dramatic and you found Jesus when you were you know, hitting rock bottom. Maybe for you it was a friend or, or a, you know, an uncle or an aunt or someone else that told you about Jesus, but every story is different. Maybe there are some things that you don't even share about how you found Jesus because it's, it's strange and different. Maybe how God is growing you just has happened through different things that have happened in your life. But Jesus always comes in an unexpected manner. Can you imagine the contrast? You know, 6,000 soldiers, a governor with all the glory and all the power and all the might and all the resources. And then here comes a, dozen, a few dozen people with a king riding on a donkey, hoping to deliver. Could he be the one, is the question that people were wondering. Is this the one that's supposed to deliver us from Rome? That's what people were thinking. So prepare for the unexpected if you want to welcome Jesus. Number two, if you want to welcome Jesus in your life daily, once you prepare for the unexpected, number two, ask him to cleanse you and then trust him. Ask him to cleanse you and trust him. That's what you need to do because people uh, ask Jesus to clean the temple, but they didn't trust him. Here's what happens. I don't know if you ever wonder, what, what's the whole deal with the palms? Why do we call them Palm Sunday? You see palms all over. You see at different churches. I remember growing up, you know, they give every kid a little palm and you're supposed to wave it. We don't see Jesus, but here we have palms. Um, and, and, you know, and you lay them down and it's just a big old deal. You know, in many churches for many years that was the case. But uh, what's the deal with the palms? Here's the deal. When people started laying palms down, palm branches down, they were alluding to something. They were alluding to an event that happened about 160 years before Jesus. See, 160 years, uh, 170 years before Jesus' time, there was a war, the Maccabean War, in which Syria had taken over the city of Jerusalem. And the, the Maccabees basically deliver the city from the rule of Syria and cleanse the temple. They took everybody out, all the idols, everything. They cleaned the temple and, and, and delivered the city. And, the, and some Jewish history says that after Simon, one of the leaders, had done this, all of the people were praising and laying down palm branches in front of them. Now picture this. The Roman legion just came in. And there is this man. We don't know if he's a prophet, a miracle worker. We don't know if he's the Messiah, but if he is, he's coming down now into the city. And what people were asking him is to do one thing. Would you clean the temple from this Roman filth? Would you clean the city from these Romans that keep oppressing us? That was exactly what people were asking him. How many of us have asked the Lord to clean our lives from something that is happening there? But you know what the problem is? 
is that Jesus is going to clean your life if you ask Him, but He may not start where you want Him to. We see Jesus come into the city and He indeed cleans the temple. But you know who He cleaned the temple from? The religious leaders. All the hypocrisy that was happening in, in the religion and the, the faith of the Israelites. He goes in there, and this is one of my favorite pictures of Jesus, because while many of us see Jesus as someone who was very kind and gentle, and He probably was, we see His strength, and we see His passion in His heart, when He has no problem taking people and running them out of the temple, because they were making business out of what was supposed to be a house of prayer. Amen. And Jesus runs them out. He overturns the tables. And he cleans the temple. And you know what Jesus thought? That what, you know what people thought about Jesus? How rude. How could he talk to, to our people like that and our leaders? We're supposed to be together, Jesus. They are the real enemy. The Romans are the real enemy, not us. And how many of us have a, a hard time when God is working in your life and he's starting to take things that you don't want him to take away? And he's starting to ask you to do things that maybe you're not ready to give up. And, and when that happens, you're going to have to trust Him. God is not going to start with the things that you want clean in your life. He's going to start with the things that matter. And it starts right here in your heart. Inside the walls of Jerusalem was this big cancer called just making religion a business. And inside our hearts, there are cancers that we need to address before we can address the things that we see. If you want to welcome Jesus, here's number three. Consider the real root of your problems. Consider the real root of your problems. Matthew 21, 9 says this, the people, the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. That word Hosanna is an expression of praise, an expression uh, of just a, of gratitude and it means save us it means literally save us so they were saying save us son of David say save us king save us in fact I love the word that Mark by the way this story of, of Jesus coming into Jerusalem is in all four gospels and each one gives you a little bit different perspective so if you can go ahead and read it when you're at home Mark 11:10 says that the people said blesses the key the coming kingdom of our father David like, we know that you're coming in, and maybe, and just maybe, we can overthrow Rome. See, even though they had 6,000 soldiers, there were anywhere from 100,000 to 600,000 people in the city of Jerusalem. And they were thinking, man, Jesus, if you organize this, if you do some kind of awesome miracle, like we've heard that you say you can heal the blind people, and even people that are dead, like Lazarus, you, I, we keep people here, we, we keep that uh, here. Hearing people say that you raised them from the dead. If you do something like that, we can maybe overthrow these Romans out of this city. And they're asking to save us from Rome. That basically, Hosanna to the son of David. It will save us, son of David, but not save us from the real problem, which is in our hearts, which is evil and sin. Save us from what we see is at hand, from what is making us uncomfortable. And, and I'm... If you read now Luke's version of this same entrance to Jerusalem, there's a part that Luke mentions that no other gospel mentions. This is that Jesus, as he was riding and coming into the entrance of the city, he wept over Jerusalem. Now picture that. Here's the king, the coming king on a donkey, which I just, you know, I know that the halls have Emmett and uh, the kids have written Emmett and I just you know picture Jesus and I'm like that had to be a weird picture okay to see the king ride on a donkey and then just a few followers but as the crowd grew you're thinking man he needs to be getting pumped up instead of getting pumped up Jesus starts crying he weeps he's like if only you had known what could actually bring you peace and he tells the city and then he basically prophetizes the fall of Jerusalem so there's going to be a time where they're going to surround you. They're not going to let you in or out. And there's not going to be a stone left over another stone in this place. And he knows that's going to happen and he, he weeps about it. He says, if only you had known what would actually bring you peace. 
You need to consider the real root of your problems. I can tell you, it's not other people that many times we blame. It's not just, you know, the solution is not just quitting work because work gets tough at times or school. It's not moving because then your family will be able to start all over. The problem will follow you and whatever you go, your problem, because the problem is inside of you. It's usually within our hearts. And it's the things that we hold on to, the things that we worship that bring this. And Jesus was saying, the problem is not the Romans, the problem is within you. The problem is the sin that lives in you. And I am the only way that you can rid yourself from that problem. Jesus was it and people missed it. People missed because they didn't know what the real root of their problems were. And lastly, as you, if you want to welcome Jesus into your life, you must prepare for the unexpected. Ask Him to cleanse you and then trust Him. You need to consider the real root of your problems. And lastly, explore your picture of Jesus. Explore what the picture of your God looks like, the picture of Jesus looks like. Matthew 21, 10 and 11, they finish this passage by saying that when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. In Galilee. The book of John says that people, even though they had seen all the signs, they still didn't believe that He was the Messiah. Our problem, the problem of everybody in the city of Jerusalem, the people that shouted Hosanna one week and the next week shouted crucify Him, was that they never understood who Jesus really was. They never had an accurate picture of who Jesus really was. And that caused them to change. You can't have endurance. You can't serve a God that doesn't exist. Because at some point, if you're serving a God that is not real, He's not going to follow through with the expectations that you have of Him. And when that happens, you're going to be tempted to deny Him. Or you're going to be tempted to walk away. When things happen in your life that you don't like, you're going to veer off course. Because your expectations of God are not what He's promising you. It's just what you think about Him. It's just what maybe you were taught. But if your expectations don't come from Scripture, be careful. You are in danger of being disappointed. The people, the reason why people could cry Hosanna one week and crucify Him the next week was because they were disappointed in Jesus. Man, He didn't do any of the things that we were expecting. We were expecting Him to come in and kick you know, these Romans out of the city and clean the temple and restore the kingdom of David. And what does he do instead? He comes in and, you know, rebukes our, our leaders. And, you know, he keeps hanging out with sinners. And, and he just keeps talking about, you know, just himself being the son of God. And we don't know who he is. Crucify him. You know, in fact, if he keeps talking like this, he's going to get us in trouble with Rome. If he has to, to, to worship God and nothing else. Crucify him. People were very disappointed in him. And suddenly, that lack of trust turned into anger. And if we don't have an accurate picture, we are in danger of the same thing happening to us. Um, the story of Joni goes like this. After she was laying there on the water, face down, praying that God would hear her there. You know, somehow someone would find out that she was actually drowning. She said, you know, she tells a story that no one was looking at her when she jumped. So that was her biggest fear. She was praying, God, can someone see me that I'm here and I can't move? And uh, as they tell the story, it says that her sister at that moment, shortly after, got bit by a crab, a little crab, and it made her turn. And when she turned to see what had bitten her, she saw her sister. And so she runs, you know, they all run and they, they rescue her and they finally get her out of the water. And the thing that Joni says is that she was being lifted out of the water. She felt this tingling sensation all over her limbs. She's like, and I felt it for a little while. And that's one of the last things that I ever felt in my limbs. As Joni hit her head in that shallow waters, she actually bent her head back so far that she had severed her spinal cord. And she's been quadriplegic for over 40 years now. Now, when 
When Joni realized that this was an answer to prayer, she said that she became very bitter at the beginning and she fell into a deep depression. She asked God in the, in the months and years to come, why? I ask you to rescue me. I ask you to help me. I ask you to, to, to be there, but why, why would you do this? This is not what I meant, God. This is not what I had in mind. Why would you do this to me? Now all of the things that I plan to do, I, I will never be able to do. And she said that she wrestled with this for a long time until one day, as she was, you know, doing, still seeking God and still a little bit angry at God, she said that not audibly, but she felt God's voice say something to her. And she said, I, I'm going to read, I said I don't want to misquote her, but here's what she says. She said, tell the story back. She says, I was heading down a path of self-destruction. I was checking out birth control, a birth control clinic. Uh, to get some pills because I knew I'd be sleeping with my boyfriend in college. Somewhere in that mess of emotions and regrets and falterings and failings, while making a sham of my Christian faith, somewhere in the desperation, I said, God, rescue me. And He responded. He did. He had to bound my body in order to rescue and free my soul. Amen. See, the reality is that the God that we serve loves you so much. I don't know if you've ever been afraid of praying for patience because you are afraid that more problems will come your way. Or if you're afraid of you know, praying for wisdom because more problems will come your way. But I want to tell you it is time to stop being afraid of praying for the things that we need because we know that God will give us what we need to get close to Him. Uh, he is so concerned with your soul. Even if things happen, He will still work through you. Even if things that you don't like happen, He will still lift you up. See, uh, Joni's full name is Joni Erickson Tada. He is a lady that uh, has been in the media, you know, quite a bit. So maybe some of you know who she is. Even though she's been quadriplegic for the last 40 years, she has a radio show, a daily radio show that, that plays in more than 850 stations. You know, across the world, she has uh, just painstakingly painted pictures by holding a brush in her mouth, and she will just do very detail, detailed, beautiful pictures like that. And she will sell them. She will go and speak at different organizations. You know, sharing her testimony, and she has an organization that helps people that need wheelchairs. You know, obtain one that can't afford it. And through all this. She has been able to minister to many, many more, more people. God gave her a husband that cares for her. And even though there are still many things that she can do, she's a, a living testimony of how God works in her life. And if, if you have a chance, just look her up and you'll see how God is using her. But here's the thing that I want us to, to leave with today. As we approach this week, that many of us, you know, try to use to remember what God did for us. I want you to, to really think of the Jesus that you believe in. And I hope that you understand that He cares so much about your soul. That He's willing sometimes to put you in uncomfortable situations for the sake of you growing. And I hope that you trust Him with that. I know I have to trust Him even though when things don't go our way, we have to trust Him. We have to know that, that He loves you. That He cares for you. And that at the end of the day, He is willing to always take you back. See, Jesus, there are some words that I now make a lot more sense. Um, when He was on the cross, one of the seven phrases that He said is, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And I feel in that same spot many times when I see that I want God to be this magic genie that lives in the clouds and I, I ask him God do this for me you know do that for me and it doesn't come to completion I'm reminded that I'm maybe worshiping the wrong God that I'm trying to make this God up that doesn't exist in the Bible but as you find and welcome Jesus I hope that you're able to find the God of Scripture and when you do that he's gonna transform you he's gonna forgive you he's gonna completely clean you but we have to be willing to go through with Him. And even when you don't, He will forgive you. 
but he will remind you of what it takes to follow him. That if we hold on to this life too closely, we're going to lose it. But if we hold on to this life a little bit loosely, we'll find eternal life in him. Let's pray and then I'll tell you what we do next. Father, hey, if you're still watching, we just want to thank you for uh, coming by and just watching this message. And I just want to share real fast uh, the reason why Harvester uh, does this is because uh, we believe that... Uh, you know, people need to hear about the Lord Jesus. Uh, it is our mission to lead people to find and follow Him. And so I just want to encourage you, if you have not received Jesus uh, in your life uh, ever, I just want you to listen to these words in John 3.16. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to but in order that the world might be saved through Him. So if you uh, have never received Jesus into your life, I, I encourage you, investigate. Take some time. This is the most important decision that you could ever make. And so what we're going to do is we're going to show you right here at the bottom of the screen, just our website. You can always go to harvesterchristian.org and find out a little more about our church. And if you don't live locally, then I just invite you find a, a church that you call home that believes in the Bible as the Word of God and just start worshiping, start learning more about who our Lord is. Um, I hope you have a great day and uh, thanks for watching.